13 years since the spaceways were first divided up. Four years since the consortium first got together. Three since the company was born. Two since the game had been completely changed simply by the addition of an opponent. Six months since their original birth had been aborted. On March 25th, 1990, British satellite broadcasting finally started broadcasting. Albeit not actually in satellite yet. Baby steps. I'm Andy Birchall, and I'm the Managing Director of the Movie Channel. And with that, BSB went on air for the first time, albeit on cable. With a message from Andy Birchall, played by Vinnie Riley, going to a costume party as Bill Nyla Science Guy, preceded by an ident unlike any we'd ever seen in this country before. In 1990, BBC One still looked like this. Channel 4 was still the most modern looking channel in terrestrial, and the height of sophistication in television idents was this, which was still an improvement over the previous champion. BSB's idents were unlike anything seen on screen before. More modern with its in-camera effects than any number of spinning computer generated polygons, and in the case of Now in the Movie Channel in particular, more sophisticated than Kelly de Brock in Versace reading Proust. Sky, for their part, had gone with a very deliberately American approach. Channel 4 writ extremely large. HTV goes to Vegas. Or garish CGI icons and only just enough variation to distinguish between stations. They stood out from the crowd all right partly with the then unique mid-Atlantic approach and partly because they were so visually loud. What they weren't was particularly creative or sophisticated, much like Sky itself. Not that I want to suggest that being populist is in any way an inherently bad thing. Quite the opposite, it's all very well packing the schedules with nine-hour avant-garde cubist ballets about the 1956 Hungarian uprising, as seen from the perspective of St. Ladislaus's ghost. If you think more than eight people are going to actually watch that mess, you're kidding yourself. A broadcaster serves the public, but not by forcing rule into its chops. Balance needs to be struck between what the public want, and what will fill them up, and what's actually good for them. What Sky did, by bypassing the whole public service thing altogether and being technically a foreign company broadcasting in this country, was to eliminate the necessity for nourishing content altogether and just concentrate on what was filling. Which didn't set a very good precedent for British television to come. But the original situation had had its own free market-based solution, specifically BBC Two. Demarking the BBC as one channel for mainstream entertainment, one for more sophisticated material, including in a technological sense, back when BBC Two was the only station broadcasting on 625 lines. Channel 4 was an example of the same thing happening to ITV. And BSB looked at the same strategy with their five channels, albeit partly out of the necessity to find some kind of identity for now after the news channel idea fell through. The service had always been intended to be programming led, which of course was a luxury it could have better afforded as a monopoly, one of many. The movie and sports channels handled themselves to an extent. The best part of a billion quid had been spent on getting the correct programming for the former, and a not insignificant amount was lavished on the likes of Wimbledon and the French Open, not to mention various football league matches for the latter. 
The power station was careful not to simply ape MTV. Alongside VJs like the young Carmen at Jogo, they had a daily genre chart rundown with Pat Sharp and his omnipotent mullet, a magazine show presented for some reason by Suggs, and all the live concerts BSB could possibly grab. Now, with programming largely supplied by John Gow Productions, was consciously the BBC Two of the Enterprise. Its programmes included wildlife documentaries, looking particularly spectacular on DMAC, full-length operas and recitals with the Royal Philharmonic, designed to take up the weekend, a programme about Nina Mishkoff yelling at the entire population of the world, a straight equivalent of Radio Falls Stop the Week with the late Mike Smith, and now Sir Robin. Basically the McLaughlin group with Sir Robin Day, who'd recently retired from the BBC after 12 glorious decades and was snapped up on the quick fast by BSB to become one of their main faces, alongside Smitty and the increasingly self-consciously smouldering Selena Scott, who fronted a daily magazine show situated roughly halfway between Nationwide and Newsnight. Which, meanwhile, amounted to hourly bulletins mostly, that dutifully went out on every single channel. After much baffled negotiation, they finally found a company to produce their news coverage, the less than prestigious Crown Communications, best known for making various management training videos for the DTI, or road safety videos for the Department of Transport, and almost nothing actually commercial. The most important thing they weren't was a news agency and this showed in the final product. BSB News was possibly the most disappointing aspect of the service. Although boasting a fairly nice aesthetic, repurposing the diamond motif into a sombre metallic grid with just a hint of the Who's Tommy, the actual news coverage itself consisted pretty much entirely of refugees from the likes of Look North sitting behind a desk, reading the news stories of the auto queue accompanied by still pictures and the occasional diagram because they had no access to any moving footage whatsoever. Claims the crash emphasises the cost-cutting priorities in British Rail. It was hard to imagine how much further you could venture from the vaunted 24-hour global news festival of the original vision for wandering into outright abstraction. It was all terribly disappointing, not to mention embarrassing. Especially given that the news coverage had been top of the IBA's original wish list for satellite TV. And even more especially when compared with Sky News, which had been producing pretty much exactly what the IBA had ordered since February 1989. Good evening, you're watching the World News from Sky Television News on the hour every hour. By contrast with the Channel for Living, Galaxy was all about the light ends. Except during the daytimes, when it was children's BSB all the way with the Galaxy Club and its endearingly lo-fi idents. These unfortunates would introduce the likes of Playabout, a play school clone right down to Floella Benjamin, the Satellite Game, a science fiction-y take on Nightmare from the same stable, although its female Hal was no patch on Treyguard. Attention shuttle crew, shuttle status, 30 seconds to orbit, Velocity dump in T minus 25 seconds. And Cool Cube, basically their answer to Motormouth and going live. Then for the grown-ups in the evenings, there were repeats of classic sitcoms, episodes of Hill Street Blues, Night Court, semi-hallucinatory American daytime soaps, oh, and some original programming too. Like Up Your News, some sort of satirical tomfoolery, mostly, in fact only, Notable now for giving a young Victor Lewis impersonator named Christopher Morris his first television work. No one in the entire world remembers having seen so much as a nanosecond of this show. But it can't possibly have been as lame as its title. 
Chinese troops who crushed the Tiananmen Square revolution have each been given a customised souvenir watch. It comes in a thousand pieces with tank track marks all over it. And then there was a trait load of game shows, including Laugh Lines with Nicholas Parsons, One False Move with Nobody, and the frankly jaw-dropping Wife of the Week. And of course, no wife is complete without the Wife of the Week rolling pin, with Wife of the Week in the wrong way round, so that when she rolls out her pastry, it comes out of the pastry. Isn't this exciting? <laughs> Which still only managed to be BSB's second most offensive programme. Galaxy Centerpiece was the entertainment's magazine 31 West, named after the position of the satellite. This was a bit like the one show with the heavy bits sanded off, and while a cheerful and entertaining programme, it would have been better with a bigger set, or even a rudimentary studio audience of the sort the one show employs. Without it, this pokey little soundstage starts to feel claustrophobic and echoey. You start to be reminded of the recurring Mitchell and Webb sketch about post-apocalyptic right. television. <laughs> you can't eat them at the same time, <laughs> presumably. <laughs> they're apples. <laughs> Hello, remain indoors and welcome. It's not bad. It looks like he's got four arms from wow. here. Wow. That's amazing, isn't it? Well done. Mind your yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> the flagship of Galaxy's original fiction programming was their apparently legally mandated answer to a soap opera. But because BSB had to be different, their soap opera was set in space. Jupiter Moon followed the adventures and the non-adventures, mostly the latter, of staff, students and officers on board a ruddy great university orbiting Callisto. A solid and laudable attempt at dragging hard SF into the mainstream, mostly hampered by BSB with the best will in the world not making it into the mainstream. And the show itself being a bit dull. Still, it was more successful than Galaxy's second most famous original show, and first most offensive. Heil honey. Heil honey. Heil honey. Heil honey. Heil honey. Hello. I'm, I'm home. Heil honey. Smile honey. Because I'm home. Gee, it's great to be Top Gun, but it's nothing like the fun that I get when I say hi, oh honey, I am home. Hi, oh honey, smile, honey. Gee, it's great to be back. Hi, oh honey, I'm home. I do now. Oh, tonight you were making schnitzel. What a joke. You must be real mad at me, honey. I'm a very, very bad Hitler. <laughs> Come here. Yes, in place of Jackie Gleason and Audrey Meadows, we have Adolf and Ava. And next door, in place of Art Carney and Joyce Randolph, we have a Jewish couple called the Goldsteins. Clearly the best idea for a sitcom ever with no conceivable drawbacks. And if you're not familiar, no, this isn't some five-minute sketch from a variety show. This is genuinely a sitcom series of eight half hours, although only the pilot was broadcast for obvious reasons. It was supposed to be a satire of two things at once. First, high-concept American sitcoms of the 50s and 60s, which often had premises only slightly stupider than this one. For every Bewitched or I Dream of Genie, there were a dozen My Mother the Cars. The second and more serious target was the dangerously reductive consequences of history being written by the winners. The way the monstrous, incomprehensible, genocidal evil of the Nazis gets reduced to the likes of Allo Allo. You put your left boot in, you get your left boot out. You do a lot of shouting and you shake your fists about. You light a little smoky and you burn down the town. That's what it's all about. Diminishing the full horror of fascism and racial supremacism into cartoon villainy, leaving it an open goal to rise again in the real world. When you put it like that, maybe it should have been on now instead. 
Anyway, it missed both targets by choosing completely the wrong format. The former could and should have been sorted out in a three to five minute sketch, and preferably one that places the action itself into some kind of context. The faux disclaimer at the start of the pilot wasn't nearly enough. As for the highbrow latter concern, it's actually something worth addressing, but not as an eight episode half hour sitcom with a single absurdist joke that's exhausted by the end of the title sequence and wasn't very funny in the first place. A BBC play for today by a writer like Robert Shearman might have done it, but not this. You're living with one slick fury here. <laughs> oh, Mr. Sausage. Oh, uh, hoochie coochie girl. In the event, Heil Honey I'm Home aired only its pilot, to the sound of jaws dropping nationwide. And while many at BSB would have taken some crumb of comfort at the idea of the company having any sort of nationwide impact at all, this was the end of September 1990. Almost too late to make a difference. It was a brutal, brutal summer. BSB's old troubles were behind them, true. The wrestling match with the technology, the intradepartmental intrigue, the disappearing investors, the struggle with ITN. But that was just the phony war. Now the actual broadcasting was happening, the struggle was really on. And BSB were losing. Sky's colossal head start placed them at the top of a very steep hill. Their dishes may have been bigger and uglier than BSB's, but at least they were in the shops. They were the only ones in the shops for more than a year. Now the squareels were finally out, they were suffering the consequences of the two systems being completely inherently incompatible. Vanishingly few people who already had one system would splash out the 250 quid to get the other. Selena Scott or no Selena Scott? Choice, convenience, speed, and value. Thank you for watching. For BSB Satellite Television, you know where to come. BSB's deal with retailer Comet couldn't compete with the Murdoch Press's relentless, hysterical shilling for Sky in at least two papers every single day forever. The timing didn't help. The time to launch a new TV venture in Britain is late autumn when everyone's shut inside their homes against the howling wind and rain, gawping at the box. That's why BSB were going to launch in September 1989. But oops, the technology's not ready, and suddenly they're going fully live in late April of the following year, right on the cusp of summer, and right at the start of the period where the last thing anyone wants to do is slump in front of a glowing monolith in the corner of the room. It was bad timing in another sense as well. As you may remember, ASG's first day of work turned out to be Black Monday, and it was an omen. The detonation on that day of the Thatcher-Reagan economic bubble had led by 1990 to full-blown recession in most parts of the Western world. Not the best time to launch a completely new, dizzyingly expensive, cutting-edge high-tech business venture. And Sky were learning the same thing. They pretended in Murdoch's papers that all was well, that they were reaching one and a half million homes, which as detailed in the previous episode was technically true, but didn't mean they were all watching, or had even asked for it, or even lived in Britain. Either way, they were bleeding cash almost as fast as BSB. The programming still hadn't improved, the most watchable shows on Sky would repeat in imports. And given the choice, which they were, most advertisers wouldn't touch them with a 50-foot pole. The founding chairman of STV famously labelled holding an ITV franchise in the 50s as a license to print money. At this point, running a satellite television company was a mandate to burn money, prodigiously and on an industrial scale. Murdoch's response was to step down as chief executive of Sky, while remaining in overall charge of the whole operation, in favour of an outsider, a man he'd admired over years of service at the feet of his deadly rival, Kerry Packer. Former Nine Network head, Sam Chisholm. 
At a broad-shouldered 5 foot 1, he initially resembled a novelty Les Dawson parking bollard. But he was actually the most feared man in Australian television. He was also about to become the owner of one of the biggest hands on the blade of the murdered BSB.